Mm, yeah. I love my HBCU. Uh. And boy, boy, I love it, love it. Yeah. I love it, love it. Yeah. I love my HBCU. Yeah. And man, yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Mm, yeah. Man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Mm, yeah. yeah. I tune into the ACCU Sports Lab to see if my team wanna lose. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, she's tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, he know what he be talking about. Mike and Charles, they know what they be talking about. They can press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna lose. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir. Mean mugging everybody. <laughs> this is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Welcome to episode 276 of Inside the HBC Sports Lab radio show and podcast. The show that's covering the sporting HBC dash for all things HBC sports from institutions large and small from NEIA to the NCAA. We share insights and information on the HBC sports culture, HBC athletic aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBC athletic program in the business of HBC sports. I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Camille, along with my co-host, Mike Washington, Charles Bishop, filming from our home studios and sending a signal live to KCOH 1230 AM studios with the Texas Radio Hall of Famer, multi-Hall of Famer Ralph Cooper in the home of Texas Southern University from Houston, Texas. Sorry for the late start, having a little technical difficulties, but we got with you. Going to display a lot of the niceties. I will say, uh, Charles, how you doing today? Doing well, Doc. Doing well. Another uh, big week as far as HBCUs. I'm sure we'll get into a little bit of the news a little bit later on, but ready to go. Yeah, it's a lot of big news. A lot of folks messing mm -hmm. with Jack State again, so I'm sure you'll have <laughs> something to smile about today. <laughs> Mike Washington, how you doing today? Uh, pretty good, Doc. How you doing? Uh, glad to be back in the house. Yes, there's news about that little bitty school in Mississippi. <laughs> just just like that. We got Dr. Good. Keaton on and we're going to get to her. What's Welcome going to the on? Show, Dr. Keaton, how you doing? You came in with the meme mug, but we're glad to see you smiling now. What's, what's no. going on with <laughs> I had an email come in. My bad. That's no, the bad no part problem, about no Zoom. Problem. Got stuff popping yeah. up. I'm good. You were, yeah, man, you were, man, I was I was looking at her picture on the profile and then I looked up and she had this meme mug. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Like, I'm just I'm just as friendly as my profile picture, I promise. I don't know. That profile picture looks <laughs> oh, like I mean, I know you got all these awards for you, you know, as a faculty student say you just grab faculty person, but you come in the classroom like that, you will scare a lot of folks. They'll be like, oh yeah. <laughs> where the drop what? plan, where the drop slip. That is until they realize I am their professor. You know, black don't crack, so they think I'm their peer until I <laughs> until I stand up there. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Uh well. Really wanted to get into it and provide some research. Oftentimes we talk about HBCUs and uh, this time of the year we like to get into HBCU research. But I'm really excited this time because oftentimes uh, we talk about HBCUs and it happens to be uh, oftentimes by the black male athletes, African-American male athletes. But you have a chance to really showcase black female college athletes in an article that you wrote. Uh, talking about the sense of belonging at historically black college universities or HBCUs. Um, obviously, we got, I got to meet you um, with my Dr. Cooper, mm -hmm. uh, as you, as we would say, basically pledged under Dr. Cooper. That's that's a different <laughs> side. Those that <laughs> went to the academy, they realized what that is. Uh, Charles is going through that now, so I'm hazing him like uh, there we go. The outdoors. I'm getting a little payback with Mike too. He's doing. Uh, in the program now, so uh, there we he go. beat up on me it. back in the I day. I love it, but, I love it. Yeah, so you got some Ooh. folks who are trying to get to the next level, but and they will eventually as they continue to do. But give a little bit about folks about your background. Obviously, BA Colorado State Sociology, Master of Education, University of Texas Higher Education Leadership Policy, uh, obviously with the Black Student Athletes, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Moore, mm -hmm. Jackson State, uh, who brings a lot of African-American Blacks, males, and females into the academy to earn their masters and doctorate. That's um, correct. Oftentimes, they include HBC graduates. You did your PhD. You went from Texas all the way to the East Coast University of Connecticut, learning leadership, educational policy, concentration, sport management, 
uh, finished December 2021, and now you're at the University of Louisville, uh, putting right. in the work and getting it done. Man, I, you, Dr. Cooper brings you up there, then he leaves you. What, what's all that about? <laughs> you know, I think um, outside looking in, it looks it looks bad, but actually he was there the whole time, um, very hands on with me. Never was always one call away, and then you know COVID happened, um, so then we were all just one call away and had to do this virtually. So. Um, it was, it was great to be up there those two years with him, but also, um, the challenges and how my scholarship, you know, evolved and changed in some ways in the management space, um, having, you know, various mentors mentor me. So it was a blessing in disguise. I can't say it was a negative experience. It's good to hear. One of the things that I remember Dr. Cooper always talks about is research. That research is essentially mm -hmm. what you want to study. So before we get into this particular study, what are some of the other things that are and, or I should say, uh, what type of research and why do you want to research what you're researching? Yeah, so right now, um, you know, really looking, I'm, I'm not sure if y'all on, uh, on the talk are familiar, but there's these diversity and athletic inclusion officers. Um, I call them athletic diversity and inclusion officers, ADIOs. Y'all probably saw a wave of them, um, an insurgents. Um, Unfortunately, after the death of George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd, um, everyone started having a diversity and inclusion officer. They were oftentimes black, uh, black women. And so I've been studying the conundrum of, you know, black women in the research and their, their lived experiences haven't had inclusion for themselves. What, what, what is that labor to then go create inclusive white organizations when you're still trying to figure out what inclusion looks like for you? Um, looking at Black women coaches. Um, you know, I know Dawn Staley has, you know, shattered records, especially with her new 2020 or $22 million uh, contract, but Black women in basketball are not head coaches. It's still very much so white women and male dominated. And so looking at that experience um, and then also turning to the WNBA. Um, and so this concentration on Black women um, athletes and leaders, but also basketball, you know, that's where that me search comes in is I was a basketball player at Colorado State. Could you play? I played. And I also like to add, there's a lot of student athletes, but I won. So I left with two championships. Uh, the way um, the Mountain West works, if you don't win the conference tournament, you don't go to the NCAA tournament. I know, unfortunately, it's like that for many conferences. So Never went to the NCAA tournament, but did win conference outright 2014 and 2015. Congratulations. Good stuff. Uh, before I let them jump in and ask some follow-up questions, let's get into this Black Female College Athlete Senses of Belongings at Historically Black College University. Why is it important to do research on HBCUs? I think I know that answer, uh, but I'd like to get your perspective and why it becomes just as important to make sure that it's inclusive of the African-American or Black female. Yeah. Athlete as well. So concentrated on the black female athlete experience, you know, there was a still a dearth of uh, research and data on uh, black female student athletes at historically white colleges and universities. But what was missing and what I really love about this piece is the cultural connection they feel to not be the only one in their sport. So they're not the only swimmer. They're not the only volleyball player. And I think it shatters stereotypes even in their own lived experience to my travel team, no one, I couldn't talk about hair on, um, you know, I couldn't uh, be a bowler and have these conversations about race and the intersection of who I am. And so, and even when I look at my own experience, I was constantly, um, you know, I loved my teammates, but they were, half of the team was from Europe. So I'm constantly having to explain blackness, I'm constantly having to explain um, the complexities of them, uh, solely focus on uh, black men, you know, they just had no context for it. And so being <clears throat> the only on my team, um, you know, I had to have these conversations with whiteness that at times, you know, I learned about myself, but it's exhausting. And so for these athletes in the HBCU space, you know, it's not perfect. You can, if you read the paper, you'll see they're still um, dealing with what other student athletes are dealing with. They don't have enough time. You know, they want more resources. That's a shared student athlete experience. But when you get into the cultural experience, I think that's what really sets HBCUs apart and what, in my opinion, historically white colleges are trying to replicate. 
you know, they're trying to create that space, but it's, mm. so, it's so organic in the HBCU space. In my opinion, you can't replicate it. Um, what you can do is, is um, think about what those black athletes need to navigate a predominantly white space, but they're not navigating in the HBU, HBCU space. They're embedded in it, if that makes sense. Well, let me, let me switch over. Uh, Professor Bishop kind of leaned forward when you got into some of that. You know, you're getting in his wheelhouse. And so I wanted to let him follow up with a question. Well, yeah, I, I wanted to follow up and, and ask this question in terms of, of replicating that space and, and, the, and the difficulty of attempting to replicate that space. Uh, how, how is it for especially diversity and inclusion officers uh, in, in terms of uh, some pitfalls that they might fall in? Uh, or the question I'm, I guess I'm trying to ask is, if uh, a predominantly white college uh, has a culture that is uh, wholly different from uh, the black athlete experience, uh, University of Texas, uh, they sing the eyes of Texas or whatever the case might be, or Texas A&M has their tradition, you know, how is it that athletes are able to attempt to navigate this space? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think, had you asked me that before what we saw, this racial reckoning of the summer of 2020, I think that's the manifestation of your question. They weren't able to anymore. I think they were able mm -hmm. to have guest speakers. They were able to bring in old football alums for the football team and see this could be you. But I think black athletes um, it's in the historically white space, their consciousness was raised in a different way to where I would say they're bringing these demands, they're bringing these concerns to the athletic department. And now in my own research, I'm seeing it puts the ADIO in a pickle because they're mm. trying to be legitimate to their colleagues. You know, they're, they're balancing power, even though in my, in my own data set, they're very um, disruptive. They wanna burn it all down, but they can't. And so everyone's still, you know, hopping this line of, we're trying to placate, but we're not trying to placate. Uh, we wanna disrupt, but how do, how do we disrupt this space? The space wasn't inherently meant for us and we're trying to make it for us. And so, that to me is what I haven't seen in my work in the HBCU space. Um, there's other tensions, but not that tension of uh, disruption on this access of race and inclusivity. Wow, that's fascinating. Mm. Yeah, that, that's powerful when you put it like that. Let me jump to uh, Professor Washington. Jump in here and get a piece of this action. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Keith, thank you. Uh, tremendous insight. I had a question I, I, on the DEI Council in the corporate world. Mm. So likewise, there's a struggle with the definition, the sheer definition of equity and inequality. And you mentioned that at the start. Um, I was wondering, how is that really, you know, transcribed, especially at H or historically white institutions? Because what I find in the corporate world is that there's a different definition for equity and DEI with white people who are trying to institute DEI programs. Mm -hmm. And that now you mentioned yourself, you know, black people that are trying to do it. How does that work within HWIs or, mm -hmm. or historic? Black? I mean, how do you reconcile those differences? Because that's the start of understanding the difference in those definitions. Yeah, I would say, um, the the difference is i think in the hbcu space there's ability to pinpoint to structures and policies and the historicity of not having resource and how laws um, cut hbcus out i know there's been lawsuits about that about hey this wasn't actually equally equal funding you gave us but you gave to this historically white college and i think on the historically white college front the ability to see how practices and structures and policies are embedded to perpetuate inequity, like that's too much. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so that's why for me, sometimes I say like, sometimes I feel like they're trying to do this intersectional work, which is great. Like we should all want to think intersectionally, but we ain't there yet. <laughs> like, right. we, like we're, to me, it reminds me of the NFL. You know, we have an issue with black men being promoted and now the Rooney rule includes women. Like, how do we make sense of that? If we didn't, we haven't fixed it for one group, how right. are we going to think intersectionally? And to me, that is the harder conversation uh, with DEI yeah. that people don't really want to have. Like, if we're still focused on this single identity issue, and we have for years, for decades, what makes you think we're ready to throw in other intersections? Because typically what happens, and I'll just take a look at the Rooney Rule, I'm curious with how that will promote white women. 
that's typically what we saw in corporate, right? Like that was the diversity. Um, and that's the point I was trying to make. In corporate, yeah. it's, it's been historically applied to white women, but it leaves out or really dislocates other groups. And it's just not applied the way it should be. So I was wondering, thank you for bringing yeah. that up. I'm sorry. I'll share you an excerpt from one of my black women ADIOs was, um, can we keep the quote? So the quote is, can we keep steering this boat in the sea of racism? And so they're talking about the, the broader institutional field of collegiate athletics. When we think about resource allocation, who the labor of this, you know, these aren't conversations that y'all, y'all already know all this, but when thinking about how do you create inclusivity if the entire organizational field is racialized? And I think that's what my ADIOs are trying to figure out. And so in my work, I'm very careful to not just say, you know, it's them. Like for me, it's not them. Like what they're trying to do is a very daunting task in corporate and college athletics. And that's why you see in corporate, they, they, they don't hold the position that long because they're exhausted. Right. Um, and so that's what I'm concerned with, particularly with uh, black women is this notion of strength that they have. They have to be strong enough to experience marginalization and strong enough to eradicate it for others. And, you know, I haven't got into it for black men yet, but um, preliminary data has showed, you know, they're, they know that black men are the commodity of the broader collegiate athletic system. And they're trying to make sense of sharing the identity with the commodity and doing this work. And so right. um, there's a lot to unpack. This is Dr. Will with Inside HBC Sports mm -hmm. Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. We have none other than Dr. Keaton at the University of Louisville talking about um, black female college athletes, sense of belonging, historically black colleges, and how that is uh, interruptive and some other ideas in this space as well. Stick with us. We'll be right back after this break. Dr. Keaton, we love to keep you on and hold you maybe another uh, 10 minutes or so so we can follow up with some questions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Stick with us. We'll be right back after this quick break. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids' apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. It's time. The inaugural Urban NerdCon is coming to Montgomery, Alabama, July 29th through the 31st. Blurds, nerds, and geeks from across the universe will converge on the capital city to see celebrity guests such as The Last Dragon, Tybok, Megan Tandy, and voice actor Dave Fenoy. Hey, how you doing? I'm voice actor Dave Fenoy with a shout out to all my geeks, freaks, and urban nerds. Just want to let you know I'm going to be there and I want to meet you at the Urban NerdCon Gaming and Cosplay event. It's happening July 29th through the 31st in Montgomery, Alabama. Hope you want to meet me as much as I want to meet you. So join us by visiting TheUrbanNerdCon.net for ticket and vendor information. This will be the premier blurred event in the universe. TheUrbanNerdCon.net Our heroes, our villains, our stories, everyone's con. See you there. Press the analytic data with your hip hop If you know them like I know them They gon' tell you if your team If they wanna love laugh And who the ball, who the ball So listen to Professor Yes sir, yes sir And pay attention Cause he gon' teach a This is Dr. Bill with Inside HBC Sports Lab With Mike Washington, Charles Bishop And Dr. Keaton Talking a little bit about black female college, uh, college athletes uh, As well as DEOs um, In terms of diversity and inclusion um, athletic directors or those in leadership positions, whatever the title might be. We wanted to go a little bit back in terms of the study, and there are a couple of things that just blew me away. And I'll open it up first to this part when, when make sure people are comfortable or aware at least. The purpose of this original study was to examine the college experience, academic, athletic, and social of two groups, Black female college athletes at Division I Historical Black Colleges and Universities, HBCUs, um, utilizing this belonging theory. The current study explored the black female college athletes navigate their experiences and manage the multiple identities, race, gender, athletic uh, status, et cetera, 
at a Division One HBCU. Um, and you looked at it in terms of focus groups, but you open up uh, with this statement that really just stuck with me. I know it, but when you read it and hear it, it does something to you. Black females occupy unique positions within the United States, society whereby they are often disadvantaged by both the dominant ideologies of patriarchy and women and racism as blacks. So when you got into that and you have an understanding of that, how does, you know, obviously being a African-American black female, how does that help in terms of unpacking that and really getting to the root of some of this research and the things that you believe that the study was able to provide uh, now those that read it? Yeah, I think, you know, being a black woman, what other people probably can't see maybe when they're studying black women or reading their experiences is just how linked uh, racism and sexism are. I think you can't untangle mm. it. And I think when you try to disentangle it, you try to see it as, you know, they're a woman and then they're black. Like, no, it's they're black women that they're they're simultaneously connected. And I think what was powerful in this work was. Um, again, that this study didn't really bolster that. Not that it didn't exist. I think what we also have to remember with, with research, it's what they shared. Um, and I think if you uh, explicitly ask someone, hey, tell me about sexism, they'll tell me about sexism, right? But if you tell someone, hey, tell me about just your broader experiences, what is it like academically? And for them not to center and focus on that to me was huge. If I was to do that in the um, historically white context, that would have came up probably way earlier in the uh, collection process, particularly in the focus group. And I think we see that. And I think to me, that is the contribution of this work. Um, if you scroll down on the paper, there's um, an excerpt about swim and how, again, that breaking that stereotype, like, yes, Black people do swim. And to be on a swim team at an HBCU, it's powerful. Um, it's not just a simple, hey, this woman is talented enough to do this sport it's challenging hegemonic ideals of blackness. Um, and I think that is what makes what they're doing much bigger than just participation. It's in my opinion, an act of resistance, particularly when they're playing some of these sports that black girls have not had access to. On the flip side, I think where I see my work going is really grappling with this class issue now, right? Like, okay, what type of um, black families have access to volleyball. Volleyball is about 15, 10 to $15,000 a year. And so if they're going division one in volleyball, even at an HBCU, they played travel ball. Um, they, you know what I mean? They had to compete at a high level. And so that doesn't change um, the cost of the sport and how talented they are in the sport, but it's something to think about. And imagine in, in this era that we're seeing with black athlete consciousness is those, um, you know, they had probably multiple options at this point, right? It, my, like my sister, I shared with you, you know, she was at a historically white college. She now decided to go to A&T. Um, and even her, there's a class thing when we think about travel sports. And so I think that's one thing that hasn't really been parsed out, um, particularly with black athlete research generally is the class identity and how do we make sense of that with black men in race and manhood and maleness, but also black women with the intersection of sexism and racism. One of the parts of research that I started looking at when you start talking about this intersectionality, in some parts of this is, is concerning to me because in the US you start hearing once you dig in, whether it's the legal side of the research, that institutions have rights, right? And so if you go in this and you say that's true, um, when you talk about, you know, playing for an HBCU in itself can be an act of resistance um, in itself. I wonder, does that also look at something that you can talk about from an institutional perspective? Obviously, you're hearing about these historically black colleges leaving uh, what many would refer to as historically black conferences, right? And this is not necessarily new. You've seen it at the NIA level. You've seen it with Tennessee State, the name of institution that's been in a historically white conference, if you would, with every other institution being historically white colleges and universities. But um, you also see it now with Hampton and North Carolina A&T. But most recently, you had Howard talk about staying in a historically black college, namely the MEAC. Could that be seen as an act of resistance saying that 
yeah, there may be financial quote unquote benefits if we look deep enough, or there may be regional alignment that makes sense. Could the fact in terms of this racial landscape and you can't escape it, even though you might want to look at different ways to try to provide different attributes to your institution. Is, is that something that you've looked at or consider or just now that I've made it a thought based on your other research, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think I'd, like I told you, I would love to, to go down that rabbit hole with you and really, and really think about that because I do think, you know, um, depending on which institution you ask, I think Colorado State would say they're always gonna have financial problems, right? And so I think um, I would like to see that as an act of resistance, um, particularly, as you know, in my other work, we're seeing um, white uh, student athletes increase in some sports and how that changes the dynamic. But we also talked mm. about offline, you know, they lack a racial consciousness to really appreciate their HBCU. And so what happens to the student population and the history of the HBCU from an athletic lens? And we can also think of a social lens, but I'm focused on the athletic lens when they do go to a new conference. How does maybe administration change? Are we going to see more individuals maybe want to go to work at these institutions because they're no longer affiliated with the Black Conference? And so I think there's a lot to think about. Um, but I, I, I would like to still see it as resistance because um, we know the resources aren't the same, right? And so we understand that that decision could be out of desperation or out of a need, out of a real need. But um, there's so much um, value in staying in these uh, historically black conferences and you see that with the student athletes powerful analysis charles did you want to follow up on that I, I saw yeah that. I, yeah and, and i guess i kind of wanted to shift focus just a little bit because i'm often curious about the pathway to uh becoming an athletic director and i'm fascinated by the complexity of of, of the diversity and inclusion officer is is this another prong uh in terms of a pathway towards uh, 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 higher leadership within the athletic park? Mm -hmm. No, we don't know yet um, because the position's so new. I, I'm mm -hmm. curious to see uh, where, you know, where this position evolves. Is there career ascension? Is there not career ascension? But I think my problem broadly at the moment is they're all not senior level administrators. Um, mm -hmm. so are. And so that, that's where I was talking to this issue with changing structures and trying to change norms. If you're not in the room where power lies, to make some of those decisions to change things, it makes their job even more complex. And so um, at the moment, I'm not sure if that will transition to an AD, but it gets me thinking, you know, those that work in academic affairs, they typically don't become ADs, right? And so I wonder if this ADIO role, you know, and there's so many different languages for it, everyone has something else, but I just call it ADIO, you know, will it um, have that same consequence? To where it's seen as you're the student athlete thing because that's what a lot of athletic mm. departments are comfortable with is these leaders doing programs they want to do an affinity group for international students for black students for latino students great um they you want to look at contracts you want to look at hiring practices um a little bit different right and those are those structural things that um they have an immense amount of resistance um, they experience, excuse me, an immense amount of resistance. And so I don't know yet. One thing that, that reminds me of is you see opportunities for um, African-American athletic directors, mainly male, but also some female men and women who come over to HBCUs and use that title space. But then the question also becomes, what have they actually learned in the other space in terms of contracts and how that can be a detriment for when they come over to HBCU and have to deal with it. So that, that's fascinating when you start unpacking what that looks like when you start to see the opportunities exist, maybe not at a historically white college, but at a historically black college, but then does that really help the HBCU uh, based on their real experience uh, right. in an athletic director role? So Mike, let me let you follow up with a question um, before we get into our last break. Yeah, so I, I think I was reading a couple of, you know, pieces in the paper, and it talked about the divergent theme, and, and it talked about, are they understanding me, and, you know, kind of the switch gears, I kind of went back to my role in the corporate world as a DEI officer, okay, 
talk to me about, you know, what does that mean in the context of a historically white institution? I think I know it. And then also at a historically black uh, college and university, are they in, are they understanding me? Because there's 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 meanings and examples in the corporate world, but that could be have a different context in the athletic world, especially going back to Charles's uh, previous question. So I think um, you know, our, if that theme was to manifest in the historically white space, I think it would be the lack of understanding again the complexities of being a black girl, a black woman in this context. I think here what we saw um, really wasn't this resistance from um, faculty or administrators. I think what was interesting is the conversation around coaches. And I think that can be bolstered. That's probably what you, the divergent theme that you were talking about um, yeah. is that what was fascinating and we didn't really parse it out because it wasn't the focus of the research question. Um, but we've seen it even with white athletes that attend HBCUs is you know, coaches still feel that pressure that we often just think, oh, it's just at the, the historically um, white colleges and universities, like not true. That that pressure is an organizational field of collegiate sport. And I think that manifests with the relationships that these athletes assume are going to happen, right? Like I'm going to a, uh, an HBCU, I'm going to assume that the dynamic is going to be X, Y, and Z. And I think when it wasn't, because they, they weren't thinking, oh, it's the same pressure that these coaches are under. Um, it doesn't matter the level. It doesn't matter the, the affiliation of the university. And so I would like to see more work on coaching in this space. Um, you know, I know y'all can probably talk about them later, but I know um, Dion has kind of become the face of HBCU coaching. But, um, you know, what does that look like for Black, black women head coaches, particularly in women's basketball? Um, that broader study I was talking about that I am collaborating with Professor Nefertiti Walker at um, University of Massachusetts Amherst, you know, there was this thought where when Black female head coaches go to HBCUs, they're stuck. And so to me, like, what does that do for how maybe they interact um, with their players? Um, and the, the one case example I'm thinking of, she was so focused on developing them holistically um, that is something to me you just don't hear about as often in the HWI space is that she really wanted to empower these young girls. Um, and so, again, I think that gets back to my point is it's a both and um, you're not yeah. going to I wouldn't just say, you know, this is the holy grail, you know, like they're going to be safe, like like nothing's going to happen. They're going to just love their experience. Like, yes, some of them will. But there's also these other complexities that. I think HBCU Black females can see how their experiences are still shared with those that go to HWIs. Thank you. Man, I like how you break that down, that divergent thing. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it takes me to going back to Jackson State with Tamika Reed and the comments she made after the Baylor game where you talking about a different level of complexity, a different level of thought for different reasons, not just as an individual, but now you talk about a gender responsibility, uh, mothering, other mothering and those kind of things. It, ooh. Yeah, you hit that on the nail. That, that other that other mothering. It's and so think about the different labor that is, right? My my head coach just had to win. Um, that that was his job as a white male, right? He didn't have these other responsibilities to think about how am I developing as a young black woman, which I think black women, particularly in the HBCU in the HBCU basketball space, carry that a little bit differently. And that interview was perfect. We'll close it right here, and like I said, we'll, we'll get a chance, and we're going to do some of that research since you uh, doubled down and you told the public world that you want to see me do that along with you. There we go. There we go. Challenge. Challenge. <laughs> but when you talk about, obviously, black female college athletes, a sense of belonging at historically black college universities, uh, this was in the Journal of Negro Education. We'll find a way to get some of the information out to our listeners because they yep. love to d dive into this, and it's important that, and you are of this ilk, much as myself, that our research does not just stay in the academy, that mm -hmm. we see it at, in a different level. Yeah, 100%. Uh, but you talk about the athletic diversity and inclusion officer, um, but this sentence here, and you brought this up a little bit, but it is the only position in which one's marginalization is drawn upon to meet the demands of a job's responsibility. That just Ooh. is heavy to me when you talk about that. But you know, yeah. we talk about black girl magic, 
it seems like in a lot of ways when you're talking about when we really look at it, we need to look at it black girl resistance. Yes. And I think, you know, when I wrote that, I, I struggled with that paper and that research because I didn't want to make it seem like that was OK. And I didn't want to make it seem like the participants were intentionally drawing upon these outsider within experiences. But because, again, like my point is because they know marginalization in society writ large and within collegiate athletics, they have this idea of, well, let me center my own experiences of oppression to think about what in inclusivity is. Um, and I think in that paper, you'll see this, this their ability to put intersectionality into praxis um, and not just use intersectionality as a theoretical lens, but you can see them talk about the intersections of these race gendered experiences and how it manifests in them thinking about other individuals. And so I conclude that paper talking about black women are literally creating inclusive organizations for themselves. Wow. Well, we'll let you go on that. We'll, we'll certainly bring you back as we continue this research. I hope folks appreciate it. You know, we're in the middle of this Title IX and many different things going on with the world, obviously with the Supreme Court ruling. Yeah. Uh, but I thought it was important to allow uh, a woman, a beautiful black woman to get on here and share a perspective of research that Thank speaks you. to a unique perspective. And again, hashtag black girl resistance. Um, we go. You put a pin on that in such a way that it, it allows me to look at it differently and I'll forever be thankful. Um, continue to move forward with that research um, and, and we'll make sure that we get it out to the people to understand that your voice needs to be heard. So again, thank you for you. Thank you. It was so nice connecting with y'all and I'll touch base with y'all later. All right. This is Dr. Ville inside the Sports Lab. We'll be right thank back you. after this break. That is Dr. Keaton of the University of Louisville. Uh, check her out. She's up and coming. You see how she's going to bring it. She's not going to hide from anybody. Oh, that spin class was brutal. Well, you can try using the Buick's massaging seat. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Can I use Apple CarPlay to put some music on? Sure. It's wireless. It's something we all like. Okay, hold on. What's your Buick's Wi-Fi password? Buick Envision 2021. Oh, you should pick something stronger that's really predictable. That's a really tight spot. Don't worry. I used to hate parallel parking. Me, Me too. too. Hey. You really outdid yourself. Yes, we did. The all-new Buick Envision. An SUV built around you. All of you. Are you hungry for authentic Caribbean food? Like jerk, chicken, oxtail, red snapper, shrimp, tofu, and rasta pasta? Well, find your way over to Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, 180 Auburn Avenue, right next to Royal Pika in downtown Atlanta. Full, but we Mango's Caribbean uh -huh. Restaurant, open daily from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. And on Friday and Saturday, we're open till 4 a.m. Come to Mango's and put some spice in your life. Oh, we've got a good thing going. Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, 180 Auburn Avenue, right next to Royal Peacock. In downtown Atlanta. For more info or directions, call 404-698-3992. Or log on to mangoscaribbeanrestaurant.com. For instant coupons, text M-A-N-G-O-S to 313131. Tell your mama hungry, papa hungry, brother hungry. Mango's Caribbean Restaurant. Authentic Caribbean cuisine. From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slow Burn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website www.slowburnwaco.com That's www slowburnwaco.com since 2000 press the analytic data with your hip hop if you know them like I know them they gon' tell you if your team if they want a lot left and who the ball won't fall so listen to professor yes sir yes sir and pay attention cause he gon' teach a lesson this is Dr. Cavill inside HBC Sports Lab hope you enjoyed the interview with Ajana Keaton, Dr. Azenar Keaton, in terms of the work that she was speaking about. I wanted to get a little bit in this news. It seemed like the collective internet again kind of broke in terms of black Twitter, particularly uh, if you want to go to the next level. Uh, HBC black Twitter broke for sure uh, when Diddy said that he was going to give a million dollars to Howard University and then a million dollars to Deion Sanders and Jackson State football. 
ending it with the quote, because he bleeds, we should play with us. I <laughs> say, sound like football. For us, by us. Okay. Mm, mm. I guess that's part of that resistance mm -hmm. uh, that yeah. people wanted, are not quite ready for. But we can understand, you know, there's financial need and people do things for the money oftentimes. We'll, we'll see what that's about. But I thought that was good. Um, HBCU Game Day took a deeper dive and had a chance to interview Larry Scott, the head football coach of uh, Howard University, just talking about that opportunity. So check that out if you would. Some good comments there in terms of that. Um, he just simply said, with the eyes of entertainment world, watch him. Sean Diddy Combs pledged to give that million to Howard, along with a million to Deion Sanders and Jackson State football. Let me go to you, Charles. Just in general, what were your thoughts uh, when they resonated? I don't know if you were watching the BET Awards. Um, and kudos to Diddy for, uh, Diddy for getting the Lifetime Achievement Award uh, in regards to that. It's a significant recognition when you recognize it that. But the way he closed it, I thought was fascinating. Any thoughts? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I was blown away. Uh, I wasn't watching it, but my phone like blew up within seconds uh, when it happened, and uh, it made me, you know, turn over to see what was going on. And then once I read it, uh, my mouth dropped because when you take a look at uh, a donation of that ilk going towards Jackson State football, uh, that's huge. I mean, what you can do with that sort of money specifically for uh, a leg within the program of, of athletics. I, I can't imagine uh, what uh, is going to spring forward for, for Jackson State football with a donation of that amount. But I, I kudos to uh, P. Diddy in terms of uh, what he's trying to do. Uh, and it's all part of that uh, lay, leveling the playing field mantra that uh, Coach Prime has talked about for quite some time. May I ask you from this perspective, Mike, I know some people were concerned that it seems like how it always gets mentioned uh, or money uh, when this, even though we know that's not the case, oftentimes you do that. But I thought it was weird in this case when you talk about P. Diddy, uh, Puff Daddy, I would say P. Diddy, um, he actually went to Howard, you know, so who else is he supposed to celebrate <laughs> Howard? <laughs> and then obviously uh, the host, Pinson, Kyle Pinson, she was – She's a Howard University alumni as well. So I thought it was fascinating when you're talking about one side of it. But in this case, it was different when these folks were literally making the argument, the real HU. <laughs> so he's like, what, what, is, what, what, what are we missing here when folks get, you know, aggravated or disappointed? Where is that coming from? Uh, I don't know. That's coming from a bad place. First oh, man. <laughs> Seriously, it's coming. I don't know where that's coming from. That's a bad place. You know, here he, this man is committed, you know, a million dollars. He committed, you know, to Howard. He went to Howard, attended, performed at Howard. Heck, I was there the home, one homecoming when he went there. That was at one of my road trips. So what, what the heck else is he supposed to, you know, commit to? What do you expect him to commit to? I'll go ahead, Charles. Sorry. You know, my grandma used to say, "Don't count somebody else's pockets because you block your blessing." And I can't, I can't figure out why people lose their mind because somebody made a donation to what they wanted to donate to. So exactly. I, 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 I <laughs> and then, and then he throws some money in the Jackson State pot. Why not? <laughs> so it's his money. <laughs> so yeah. When, when my guy at Morehouse, when he decided to take on the debt of everybody that was graduating from Morehouse. I mean, that's what he wanted to do. Who are you to count his pockets? So I can never figure out that weird perspective from people. You know, did you get more? I mean, uh, H, 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 you know, give credit to HBCU Sports and a couple of, uh, you know, you didn't get mad at Chris Paul when he donated uh, money to several universities. I, you know, he's taking classes, Winston-Salem State. You're going to get mad because he's not at Elizabeth State? I mean, he, <laughs> I mean, you didn't get mad because George Lynch, uh, uh, and he's done. You didn't get mad at rap, uh, you know, what, what was the rapper, uh, Travis Scott? He's donating money. You're going to get mad at every celebrity. Where does it stop? You know, they're donating to HBCUs. Where does it stop? It is their money. It is benefiting an HBCU. Let's leave it there. Let's shh. <laughs> Let me stick with you, Mike. What are some other news you wanted to share? I'm still going to let it go. <laughs> I'm still, I'm really still on let it go. So uh, I, I, I was going, you know, ask CB, you know, 
Yeah, I know he's got his travel plan books, but this Bethune Cookman, the host Jackson State at an NFL stadium. I want to turn that over to, to CB and see what his thoughts. Any change, any expected differences? I'll I'll let you have it. So. I know he got to change the airfare. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, you know, it's Bethune Cookman's home game, so uh, we will allow for them to uh, do what they want to do with that he home said game. We will allow. <laughs> 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 I was crazy about that state. He said it. You see how he slipped that in? We'll allow. <laughs> hey, man, you know, um, <laughs> off to Jacksonville we go. <laughs> Thinking with you, Charles, what's some other news out there that is exciting for you right now? Well, that, that was going to be one of those things. Uh, Bethune Cookman, they will be hosting Jackson State at uh, the Jacksonville Jaguar Stadium. Uh, that uh, uh, game will now be uh, in. Jacksonville, Florida, but some other news out there, and this is huge news in the world of women's basketball. Dariana Lewis, she has entered the transfer portal uh, from Alabama a and Of course, she was a stalwart uh, on those basketball teams the past two years, uh, Alabama a and being right there in the upper echelon uh, over there on, uh, with women's basketball, but a uh, huge loss for that Alabama a and program with all sweat for Dariana Lewis entering the transfer portal. Before we go into this last break, I want to talk about Jarvis Christian as men's and women's wrestling for HBCU sports. I'm not sure if we've seen an HBCU wrestling program uh, in the South, particularly the Southwest. So this is fascinating to see uh, this in Texas at Jarvis Christian University. Notice I said Jarvis Christian University as they also changed from Jarvis Christian College to Jarvis Christian University. That was uh, brought to attention by Athletic Director Bob Ladner announced the addition of men's and women's wrestling program as the expansion of JCU's athletic department. Um, they'll be starting their program in the upcoming year. It's going to be fascinating to see what that looks like uh, in terms of them participating in the Sooner Athletic Conference, even though they are a member in all other sports of the Red River Athletic Conference. With that, let's take our last break. We'll be right back on the other side, talk a little bit about more news, and get these two gentlemen thoughts on the world of HBCU starts. Sports. Stickers will be right back after this last break. Since 2002, Empowerment Resources, Inc., a nonprofit organization, has empowered more than 1,500 youth and adults in Duval and surrounding counties. Through its programs, Journey into Womanhood, Girls Mentoring, Life Skills for Teens, and Parenting Education Coaching. To get involved with programs, volunteer, or donate, visit www.empowermentresourcesinc.org. Follow us on social media, facebook.com forward slash empowerment.resources and instagram.com forward slash empowermentjax. For 200 years, Montgomery, Alabama has been making history by people who had the courage to stand up for change. Today, this riverfront city has been reborn embracing the past and looking forward to the future. From the National Memorial for Peace and Justice to the stage of the Alabama Shakespeare Festival, this is where history was and is made. We are proud to call Montgomery home, and together, we can be the change. Are you ready? It's time. The inaugural Urban NerdCon is coming to Montgomery, Alabama, July 29th to the 31st. World was happening. Rob Morgan here. Just letting you know, July 29th to the 31st, I'll be at Montgomery, Alabama, Urban Nerd Con. Come on out, get something signed, take a photo, say hello, let's share some stories and create some memories, you know? Peace. So join us by visiting theurbannerdcon.net for ticket and vendor information. This will be the premier blurred event in the universe. UrbanNerdCon.net. Our heroes, our villains, our stories, everyone's con. See you there. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot left. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes Sir, yes, sir. and pay attention, Boy, cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Bill with Inside HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Sticking with you, Charles, coming out of that break. I know there's some other women's basketball news that you want to share as well. What do you? What's on your mind? Somebody in the portal? Yeah, let's keep an eye on Don Thornton's UAPB uh, Lady Golden Alliance. They added a newest uh, member of the basketball team, Maui Davenport. She's a former uh, 
five-star prospect from class of 2024. She started her career at Rutgers before transferring to Georgia. So Mallory Davenport, 6'4", center from Troy, Alabama, now joins the UAPB uh, Lady Golden Lions roster. Pair her with Zay Green, Richard Jr. coming back. And I'll tell you what, UAPB uh, Lady Golden Lions, they could be trouble over there on the, on the Western Division. Yeah, this is a Golden Lions team that people may have forgotten. In non-conference schedule, they got some of the best non-conference wins of the conference in terms of non-conference. Also remember that they were one of the teams that played Jackson State women's basketball that won everything. They played them really well. That was both uh, in terms of the regular season, at last game, mm -hmm. and in the tournament, especially mm -hmm. for three quarters of that game. It seemed like they just slightly ran out of the gas in the championship pedigree, and Jackson State was able to kick in. But to your point, this is a team – uh, quietly that people need to keep their eyes on in, in terms of what Coach um, Don is doing over there. Um, this is, should be a formidable team yeah, in terms yeah. of keep your eyes on. With that, let me go to you, Mike. What else is on your mind in terms of HBCU news in the atmosphere? Yeah, courtesy of a couple of sources, again, give those folks credit. HBCU game day, I think it was HP Sports. Um, I think I saw a blip on um, Twitter. Grandma State Hooper, Prince Moss, drafted by the Harlem Globetrotters. So he was selected in the 2022 Harlem Globetrotters draft. Wow. So he's a uh, native, played for four seasons uh, for, Grand for the Grandma State Tigers between 2018 and 2022. Throughout his career, he averaged, what, 22 and five, eight point, uh, uh, minutes, eight points, three rebounds, and uh, a game at the position. He shot pretty much 43% from the field, 35% from deep over the course. But um, there's a quote saying that this guy can completely fly. Mm. So not only did he compete for the Tigers on the court, but he also had, uh, did his thing on the track and field. He competed in the high jump during the 2022 NCAA regional preliminaries this past May, and he finished 19th in the competition. Quite the athlete, so congratulations to Prince Moss. I watched him catch a couple off the rim. He he can fly. No, <laughs> yeah, look no, out. Look he's out. He's entertaining. He's yeah. Entertaining. Look out, Curly Mo. Look yeah, out, Curly. Yeah, he is extremely <laughs> entertaining. I, I'm glad to hear that for the young man to get a chance to continue. Because, like I said, he's extremely in, in entertainment. As you can see, he's talented. And until you hear it again, I always forget that he did that in track and field. And like you said, not just conference-wise, regional. So, Extremely yeah. talented. Congratulations to Prince Moss. Talking about counting other people's money or other folks sharing the money, Baltimore Ravens award inaugural Ozzie Newsom scholarship to 20 yep. city school graduates attending, attending Maryland HBCUs from uh, BaltimoreFishbowl.com. This came for a total of 20 Baltimore City high school graduates that are each incoming freshmen to one of the Maryland's historically black college universities. Uh, that's Bowie State, Coppin State, Morgan State, and the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Baltimore Ravens owner uh, Stephen Swascotti and his wife Renee created the scholarship program in honor of longtime Ravens executive Ozzie Newsom. Stephen and Renee Vascotti's foundation made a $4 million gift in his name to all the four Maryland HBCUs, providing 1 million scholarship funds to each of the institutions. Uh, the foundation donated 400000 to the college bound foundation to fund the Newsom Scholars participation in that program. Big time, big time move. Shout out to the Baltimore Ravens, uh, Steve Muscati and his wife for making that happen, especially in the name of Ozzy Newsom, uh, executive that had a lot of success for the Baltimore Ravens there. I'm going to have to shout out to Ben Cavill. See, played at his professional football time there and I got to see the Ravens. So uh, I got a different perspective when I got to see that in there. I did want to be remiss, and we'll talk about this maybe a little more on Thursday in detail, but wanted to get it out there. I got a chance to be on there and provide a question uh, from a virtual perspective, and that was the 2022 Cricket MEAC SWAC Challenge kickoff media presser. Um, Howard, for those at all upset with Howard, they really going to uh, lose their mind. Uh, but this was scheduled before. I don't uh, maybe maybe different. They hadn't played in it. The yeah, XWAC challenge yep. before, uh, but Howard University Bison um, will take on Alabama State. That is Coach Larry Scott and uh, Eddie Robinson of Alabama State provided some great open dialogue and questions. 
I like the fact that they included this, um, although, and they brought him up there. Um, and one of the things I've been pushing for a while is they had the band directors provide some remarks. Uh, that was Kelvin Washington for Howard University, Showtime Band, Dr. James Oliver, Oliver of Alabama State's uh, band there. So I thought that was fascinating that they mixed it up. Finally, people are listening. I, and, you know, I tried to tell them some marketing keys of what to get done. Charles, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, that's huge. That's, a, that's an element uh, that, that makes the HBCU football game uh, tremendous, one of the most exciting events on Saturday. So uh, you definitely want to be able to utilize uh, the band, band directors, and let them talk about their programs as well. Yeah, when you talk about opening up John Grant, executive director of the Cricket MEAC Swag Challenge, and that's the 17 uh, MEAC Swag Challenge as well as the Cricket Celebration Bowl. Um, you had the VP and Chief Marketing, Anthony, uh, was there, um, along with Tanitra Batiste, who moderated the event. Any final thoughts on that from you, Mike, in terms of the MEAC Swag Challenge? Uh, Steve Gaither, shout out to Steve Gaither, asking his questions in terms of the lopsided wins by me, Swag Challenge. I did jump in there and text him and say, it has been two and two in the last four matches. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, but um, <laughs> I, you could tell, though, in a lot of ways that Eddie Robinson Jr., in terms of coming from the SWAC, was really immersed in that question. And he basically said, I'll tell you personally, he said, this is SWAC. We're not supposed to lose like that. He said, hey, the record speaks for itself. You know what would be cool? What would be cool is you get to rename it uh, if you win that challenge or if you win the Celebration Bowl. Now it becomes the Swag Miag Challenge. If the Miag wins, the Celebr they call the Miag Swag Challenge. Just, just something, something to throw out yeah. there. Yeah, oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty yeah, put your little you thing on it. That's a great, great marketing idea. You know, put your little, you know, put your little spin on it. I like yeah. it. Yeah. So, hey, I, we can do it here. We can do it here. If they don't <laughs> it exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm interested. I'm interested in uh, the Howard alumni. I'm a, how, how are they going to travel? You know, how are they going to show up? What's the presence? You know, Alabama State's going to be there. I want to see. I want to see where the Bison contingent. Come on, come on Bison contingent. Come on. I want to see where the Bison contingent is. So they, they they said they will be there, but the problem is, is they're going to be in the suite. Is that what? <laughs> <laughs> And I, they, I, they enjoy their football differently than y'all. Y'all yeah, worry about it. They ain't got no money. They'll be there. They just be in the suite. They just sit there. I talk to my they friends. I talk to some of my friends. I talk to some of my friends in the court. I talk to some of my friends in the court. Talk some of my friends in the court. I was like, y'all going to be there? Oh, we don't, we're, we're going to be there. Whatever. They, you know how, how bougie Howard is. Whatever. You're right. They're going to be up in the suite. They gonna be in some air conditioned car outside listening to the game. <laughs> With an yeah, umbrella, that's cold, on top. that's cold blooded. That's cold blooded. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you about the Howard folks. They are gonna come get you. They are gonna come get you, Mike. That was Mike. That wasn't me. That was Mike. Let them come. Let them come. I want to see the Howard condition. You, you, you mean there's a rank and file Howard fan? Really? Oh. I, I want to oh, see the Howard fan. Charles getting in the mix as well. well see, I want to see, see the Howard fan come out. out. <laughs> it's not the sports lab. Let me go for these guys get themselves in even more trouble. Make sure you share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Kenyatta Faville, the Dean of HBC Sports, coming from inside the lab in the College of HBC Sports with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop, with our guest, Dr. Ajene Keaton, providing you some insights uh, on her research. Again, we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Ville's Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop, every Tuesday and Thursday. We'll be back on Thursday at 6 o'clock Central Standard Time. Apologize for the late start, but we got it to you. We look forward to next week as we uh, discuss the latest in the news. And with that, I mean Thursday. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. That's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. That's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. Inside HBC Sports Lab 1 on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, as you know. Inside HBC Sports Lab. Dream big. Continue to move forward. Make sure you download my JVN, my BCSN, the app. So we can continue to do what we do. Make sure you're listening to Sports Rap with Brian and AD. Uh, Strike Zone, the ONG Strike Zone, as they bring it to you, as well as Carlos Brown, uh, as he brings it to you every Saturday, providing you the latest and greatest. We will talk with you soon, Charles. Of course. Mike. Lecture. Dismissed.